Welcome back to the Cycling Tips Podcast, everybody. I'm Kaylee Fritz. I'm Neil Rogers. And I am Braces McGillicuddy, also known as James Swan. <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, uh, where are we, Neil? What, what are we doing right we now? We are at the Rafa Clubhouse uh, on Pearl Street in downtown Boulder, Colorado. Uh, in front of us, there's a wall with bike hooks over there. There's a TV with the Vuelta Espana on. And behind, a lot of Rafa apparel, as well as a cafe. we got a lot to talk about today. We, as promised are going to do some Vuelta stuff. Uh, Neil, you're going to run through what's happened to the Vuelta thus far. We're going to talk a little bit about what's in the future for the Vuelta. We've got a couple more weeks to go. And then, James, we're talking about electronic drivetrains and when they go wrong. Neil, let's start with racing. The Vuelta thus far. So we're five (laughs) stages into the Vuelta España. So far, we've had a team time trial, essentially two field sprint stages and two... GC ish, well, one for sure GC stage today. Summit first, summit finish. Um, I would say at this point, uh, Colombian Miguel Angel Lopez, aka Superman, Superman um, Lopez, is uh, probably looking the best of the GC contenders. He finished 12 seconds ahead of Alejandro Valverde and Primoz Roglic, and nearly one minute ahead of Quintana, and even more ahead of Chavez. Uh, I think one of the more interesting points of this race, if you consider that uh, Richard Carapaz won the Giro and Egan Bernal won the Tour, is there's a very good chance that all three Grand Tours this year will have been won by South American riders. Uh, Because it's not just Lopez, although he looks best. There's also Quintana, uh, Rigoberto Iran, and Esteban Chavez. So there's four riders who could win this race and make it the uh, South American trifecta for the Grand Tours this year. That would be pretty incredible, actually. If, If you're sort of thinking about you know, sea changes within the sport. That is indicative of, well, where the future of Grand Tour racing is really pointed. That's that's pretty phenomenal. Also notable, um, a few GC contenders, if we wanted to call them that. They were no longer contenders. Uh, Steven Kreuzwick, third at the Tour de France, already out of the race. He hurt his knee in the uh, pileup in the Stage 1 team time trial. And then, curious, uh, Ineos had Theo Gegenhart and Wout Poles uh, they both lost serious time on stage two, uh, like 10 minutes. Yep. And so they're no longer in the GC hunt. So that's three names already out, just five stages in. As you say, a huge amount of racing left to go in this Vuelta. Right now, Lopez does look the best. Is there anybody else that stands out to you as looking like a, a, a contender? And again, with the caveat that it's very early. <sighs> Alejandro Valverde looked very, of course. very good today. Uh, you I know mean, what that tells me? He wins Worlds again. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at this point, there's very little that Alejandro Valverde could do that would surprise yep. any of us. But honestly, I mean, he was the next best GC rider after Lopez mm-hmm. on the climb today. You know, this is sort of tangentially um, affiliated with the Vuelta, but I found it pretty interesting. So Richard Carapaz, the Movistar rider who was supposed to be racing the Vuelta, won the Giro d'Italia, um, was injured the week before the race started and was not able to compete. And I don't quite... The details are a little bit sketchy, but from what I understand, um, the team reported originally that he had been injured training, and then it was revealed that he had actually been injured competing at a post-tour criterium and had not informed the team. And, you know, there's uh, pretty substantial reporting rumors that Carapaz will be leaving the team for INEOS next year. And it's hard to imagine ending things on a worse note, and I'm actually wondering if there might be a lawsuit. If, uh, you know, if he was supposed to race the Vuelta uh, and be part of the Movistar Trident, right, yep. with Quintana and Valverde, and it's a Spanish team, it's their race, it's obviously very important to them, and he did not have permission to race at this criterion. I'll be very interested to see how that plays out, particularly given that he's leaving the team. The thing that's kind of odd is, I mean, if you're that rider who is thinking that, oh, I'm going to go get myself a, a nice little payday at this post-tour crit, it's not like you can do that kind of like under the radar. Like, you know, what are you going to do? Like put on a, like a mustache and funny <laughs> hat and wear a different kit or whatever? Like, that would be kind of amazing, actually. It, it would be kind of amazing. Yeah. Like, you know, you'd have to make out the check to somebody else. I'm like, but the whole point is you that you're that? there as you. I mean, the, you know, the, well, the, the post-tour crits are, showing, are, are paying these big-name riders to show up because they're big-name riders. Right? Which, you can't really come anonymously. Which makes it all the more ridiculous that if he knew that he wasn't supposed to be doing this race and didn't have permission to do this race, mm-hmm. why would he think he could get away with that? A couple other just small news bits um, that, we, that happened since our last podcast. Marcel Kittle made it official. He's mm-hmm. retired from the sport. He's out. 
he's done. Um, any thoughts on that? Um, it's one of those things where I think the general consensus when that news came out was sort of a, 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 as a fan, you're a little bit sad because he was a phenomenal rider to watch and he was super fun to watch and he, he made races, you know, he made sprint stages interesting and he was uh, always a great ambassador for the sport. And so, you know, for your personal connection to pro cycling, that was a, a bit of a bummer, right? Uh, but at the same time, he's explained numerous times that, you know, he just, his head wasn't in it. He just, he could not, he could not, like keep himself motivated well and ultimately i mean if he felt that he had to retire in order to take care of himself for his own well-being then yeah obviously you have to respect that and you can't you can miss that he's not going to be around anymore but you also have to come to grips with the fact that he's not there for our entertainment yeah well it kind of is i mean <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's the thing it's like was it was was yeah i mean you know this is they are there for our entertainment. There is no inherent value to riding your bike around in circles very fast. Well, what I mean is that he is not obligated to sacrifice his own well-being for, for our entertainment. That, yes, that I will 100% agree with. There was a quote from Kittle in uh, either an interview or his statement. And he said something along the lines of, I don't want to raise my child over FaceTime. Yeah. And that really resonated with me as a father of a three-year-old daughter. You know, I mean, they spend anywhere from, what, like 80 to 120 days on the road between racing and Minimum. training camps. Oh, yeah. I, I would say it's much more than that. And, uh, you know, to, to, to have a, a small child at home. If, you're not, if your heart isn't fully into it, that right there would be enough for a lot of people to say, okay, I'm yep. ready to walk away. The only other thing I've got on the racing side, Mountain Bike Worlds this weekend in Mont Saint Anne here in North America in and Canada. Mountain Bike Worlds just wrapped up. Oh yeah, who won? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Not first whatsoever. ever, first ever e mountain. Well, we'll get to that on the next yeah. week's pod. Um, <laughs> Nino Scherter and Kate Courtney will both be there to defend their titles. I think we mentioned this uh, on a recent podcast. Matthew Vanderpool will not be there to challenge Nino Scherter. So Nino uh, takes a sigh of relief. We can hear from here. Uh, <laughs> And yeah, Nino, I think Nino Schurter is the big favorite. There are five to ten women who could all win. Uh, you know, Kate Courtney has had a great season, uh, but she hasn't been close to the top in the last few races. So, uh, you know, Yolanda Neff is probably right up there as a favorite as well. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll be watching. It's going to be awesome. I love them. Always. I love the Mountain Bike Worlds. Yep. James. Kaylee. Sometimes electronic drivetrains break. No, 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 never. never. I think it's true. Yep. And the problem is that when they break... They're broken. You've, it's very broken. Cannot be fixed. I mean, are they broken or do they just have a bug? Well, see, here's the thing. I would argue that pretty much everyone who's ridden a good modern electronic drivetrain would say that it does work better. It just does. I mean, they're faster, they're more consistent, they're, you know, they're generally more reliable, you usually kind of but i mean but but recently over the last couple of days i mean a couple of things have come to light that have you know really kind of had me thinking about it a lot and yeah, jorge cubero was in the breakaway yesterday at the vuelta and his fsa we drive train basically went wah, wah. Wah, and wah. it was he was stuck in his hardest gear and yep. couldn't shift up front couldn't shift up back and you know it, the camera panned away at that point they were kind of just he was he was done like his day is over um so uh, there was that. I mean, there was, of course, the, the Balcomalama thing a, a couple months ago. One of the most hilarious ever, really. <sighs> Depending on your point of view. Depending on uh -huh. whether you work for a company that begins in S and ends in RAM, which we don't, so we think it's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, the, but anyway, the I mean, point being that it happens to everybody. It, it happens I mean, to Shimano, it happens to SRAM, it happens to now yes. FSA. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Campagnolo, I mean, everyone has had Definitely electronic drivetrain related issues. Yeah. And the thing is, you know, like I was saying earlier on, I think pretty much anyone who has spent a lot of time on, an, on a modern electronic road drivetrain specifically can attest that it does work better. But when they fail, the failures are... That, you know, they tend to be more absolute and catastrophic. Mm -hmm. uh, and the ability to diagnose them while you're riding or on the road is basically zero. Are you advocating for people returning to mechanical shifting? Yes and no. Because the thing is, I mean, I do run mechanical shifting on my own personal bike. Kaylee, you do too. Yes. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of reasons for that. For, you know, for me, I mean, it, I mean, I know how to install it. I know how to work on it. I can do whatever I want on it. I, I just find that it's simpler. I don't have to worry about batteries and all the other stuff. Um, I think it also is important for people to understand that, I mean, when you do add 
more complexity and more features and you know just more technology to whatever you're writing, you are also introducing the, the chance for more things to go wrong. Mm -hmm. If you've made that decision, is this something you just have to live with? Basically, is this just it's it's a trade off that you you're gonna have to call Uber every once in a while. Yeah, clearly, or like bring a voltmeter with you, or <laughs> like you know bring your laptop so you can plug in, you know read your arrow. I code. always bring my laptop every ride. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys, that's enough from us this week. Thanks as always for listening to the Second Tips podcast. If you haven't already, we are on YouTube now. You can go check us out. It's an edited version. We went through the whole trouble of showering, putting pants on, coming all the way down here. You can go through the trouble of clicking on a YouTube link. Doing my hair. We believe, yeah. James did his hair. Uh, we believe in you. You can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and now YouTube. Do all the things. Leave, leave us a comment. We'll be back next week. Bye, everybody. Yeah.